There we are. Uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sorry for the delay there. Welcome to the ENS webinar dealing with the potential implications of the decision of the Labour Appeal Court in Innova versus Barlow Rand Equipment. Uh, an interesting decision because it deals with the implications that arise from an earlier early decision of the Labour of the Constitutional Court in the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development versus Prince. This decision uh, of the Constitutional Court dealt with the question of the legality of cannabis use. It found that cannabis use ca is decriminalized. The can use of cannabis, uh, cannabis, the possession of cannabis, as well as the um, cultivation of cannabis is, is no longer illegal. The question then arises, how does this impact on employers? Can employers introduce rules in this regard? insofar as they impact on the work and employment relationship? And if so, what form do these rules take? Uh, I think our view is that we can do so. So this, this seminar will deal with what these rules can be, what the limits of the rules will be, and how they can be applied safely without can be challenged in the Labour Court or the CCMA proceedings. My name is Peter LaRue. I'm an executive consultant here at ENS. I will act as a moderator or chairperson of the uh, proceedings. Uh, my colleagues, Audrey Johnson and Balandili will be discussing these issues. Uh, they are both executives here at ENS, and we will be trying to provide some guidance and some answers, or at least provide some questions that we will have to consider. Uh, we have allocated some time at the beginning, at the end of the session for questions. If you have questions, please type them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Right after that introduction, let's get going. I think we must start, Audrey, by you providing us with an overview of the facts of the decision, what the court said, what issues arose, and what findings were made as a background to some of our discussions that take place afterwards. Thanks, Audrey. Over to you. Audrey, you are muted. Sorry about that. I was having screen troubles. Um, thank you, Peter. Afternoon, everyone. I'm assuming that most of you have probably read in the press about the judgment um, and that you have a, a vague idea of the facts. But just to give you a broad um, overview of the salient facts. So the employee concerned was a woman by the name of Bernadette. She worked at Barlow World Equipment as a category analyst, um, which was an office based job. And Barlow World has a zero tolerance policy in respect of the possession and consumption of alcohol and drugs. And they also strictly prohibit access to the workplace if an employee does not test negative for alcohol or drugs. Um, and they have, employees have consented to medical testing to test for alcohol and um, drugs in their system. And the testing is either taken, takes place either randomly, voluntarily, or on a scheduled basis. Um, Peter mentioned the Prince judgment, and I think we all know as a consequence of that judgment in the Constitutional Court, the private use of cannabis was decriminalized. And Bernadette started using cannabis in the privacy of her home um, following the Prince judgment. And she said that she used cannabis um, to treat her symptoms of uh, sleep issues that she had, pain that she suffered from as a result of anxiety, and that her preference was to use cannabis as a treatment for these ailments um, because the prescribed medication, the conventional medication that she had been prescribed um, had negative side effects for her. Um, so she admitted that she would smoke a joint every single evening. She would also use other cannabis products like cannabis oils and also admittedly used cannabis recreationally. So in a January, I think it was of 2020, to regain access to the workplace, she had, had to undergo medical testing and this yielded a not uh, negative test result um, and cannabis was detected um, from a urine sample that, that was taken. And as a result, she was denied access to the workplace. She was sent home for seven days 
And what the Barlow World policy required is that an employee would then have to be retested and would only be permitted access to the workplace when they no longer have a, neg uh, a not negative test for cannabis. So she was tested again on four occasions in February, but because she carried on using cannabis throughout this period, every time the test was not negative and she couldn't um, come back to work. And eventually a disciplinary hearing was convened and she was dismissed for breaching the policy. Um, her matter was initially heard in the Labour Court and the Labour Court found that her dismissal was fair. And she then took this on appeal to the Labour Appeal Court and it's this judgment that's the, the topic of our discussion today. And the Labour Appeal Court found that her dismissal was automatically unfair. It found that Barlow World's policy was unfairly discriminatory towards cannabis users um, in that it was overly broad and it constituted an invasion of her right to privacy um, and to do something that she was lawfully permitted to do in the privacy of her own home. Um, as a result, the Labour Appeal Court awarded her 24 months remuneration as compensation, and that amounted to just over 100,000 rand. Um, and the, the reason the court said, apart from it, the policy being overly broad and the manner in which Barlow World was applying it being overly broad, another reason why the court found that it was unfairly discriminatory is that it differentiated unfairly between um, cannabis users and people that consume alcohol. And the main reason for this is the fact that cannabis stays in one system for much longer than alcohol does. And the fact that you test positive or, or don't yield a negative test um, for, for cannabis, and there is cannabis in your system, does not necessarily mean that you're intoxicated, unlike the case of alcohol. And that the court found was unfair differentiation that resulted in unfair discrimination. So the judgment's very interesting to us as lawyers from a number of perspectives, including from the perspective of the law on discrimination and the ground of discrimination that the court relied on. But I don't think that's something that we want to address with you today. More importantly for all of you is what are the practical implications of this judgment? Um, and we think that it does give rise to some very important practical considerations with regards to the design and implementation of policies that prohibit um, the possession and use of, of drugs and alcohol. And I think employers are going to have to relook at those policies in light of this judgment. And we just wanted to discuss those more practical aspects that arise from this judgment to give you a sense of the things that one should be considering arising from it. Thanks, Audrey. Um, one of the more practical aspects that we have to deal with, perhaps almost as an introductory comment, is the idea of testing underlying most of our discussions this afternoon will be the, what te, what, that employees can be tested or whether they can be tested. Um, what tests are available, what forms they take, and how accurate these tests are, of course, are issues that we'll have to consider in the future. Bonnie, can you give us some sort of indication of what the position is at, at present in this regard? So uh, thank you, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it seems from the literature that is available and just from some of the experience that we've had, there are a number of tests, uh, but the more common ones are the urine tests, blood tests, saliva tests. I've seen also some hair, testing of hair particles, uh, but I just maybe want to focus on the first three. Um, in relation to urine testing or blood, uh, blood testing or saliva testing, these tend to uh, yield, diff so this tend to pick up THC um, that has been, uh, the presence of THC, I beg your pardon, in a person's body uh, long after the consumption of the cannabis, depending also on how occasional or how often a person intakes cannabis, this will also then affect how long after the use of the cannabis, the THC, which is the active uh, high drug um, a component, I beg your pardon, in the cannabis, will be found lingering in a person's body. So um, when they talk about occasional users, they typically are talking about someone who is using cannabis up to three times uh, in a week, moderate users four, to four times a week, uh, daily users, which is typically called chronic users. And then there's something called a chronic heavy user, which is someone that uses cannabis or intakes cannabis 
more, um, more than once a day, so multiple times in a day. So depending on the frequency within which a person consumes um, cannabis and depending on the type of test, uh, cannabis can be detected uh, long after the person has consumed it. So by way of example, if you are using a urine test uh, and you are an occasional user, you can typically pick it up um, three days after even it has been used. Uh, if you are using a blood test and uh, you are dealing with a chronic user or a heavy chronic user, it can be detected in the person's bloodstream uh, for over 25 days after it has been used. And similarly with saliva testing. So the most important point, which is also a point that came out of um, the, the judgment, is that the THC lingers in a person's body long after the consumption. Uh, of cannabis. There is another test, uh, for a, a breathalyzer test that has been spoken about in the market. Um, there is a, an international company that professes to have designed one and it's in, the, it's in the market. And what they say is that that breathalyzer test can detect um, cannabis use up to three times after it has been consumed. So that will be much closer to the point of consumption. But there is other literature in relation to this very same product uh, that says that it's not yet reliable. So there is a debate in the market as to whether or not there is a reliable breathalyzer test that is available. But it seems to me is that if that ever comes fully into the market and it becomes reliable and it tests for um, cannabis uh, up to three hours after consumption, that may be a much more useful tool. But at the moment, uh, it seems that uh, employers really just have the urine test, the blood test, and the saliva test to rely on as things stand. I must just qualify uh, part that all of this, uh, having said all of this, I'm not a medical <laughs> practitioner. So please, um, uh, we, we, we are quite interested into what our medical, uh, yeah. Our, our occupational health practitioners have to tell us. And it seems to me that medical science is going to be a very, very important element um, in employers assessing their policies, conducting their risks, et cetera. And we cannot leave those important um, areas in our businesses behind. Bonnie, you mentioned THC. I'm not going to ask you to pronounce what THC, uh, to the, what THC stands for, but perhaps you can just explain what it means. So as I understand it, uh, sorry, as I understand it, it, it is the active component or ingredient in cannabis that is responsible for the high, so to speak. Um, I mean, there are other components to it like CBD, uh, but that's not the one that's responsible for the high. And so that is why um, each of these tests that I've mentioned particularly test for the presence of THC in a person's body. Okay. Thanks, Bali. I suppose the central problem we face with most of these tests is that they test out, um, the, the, the possession or the use or the, the, the of, uh, of THC long time for a, for a huge length of time. And how does that impact on the work relationship? And that's one of the problems we're going to face. Um, I suppose the next question must be, I think nobody would deny that being under the influence of cannabis whilst at work can constitute a disciplinary effect. The question we've got to ask, however, is how does an employer go about establishing that there is intoxication in that sense of the word? Now, when we're dealing with alcohol, um, it's easy. We've got our factors. We know what we looked for. We look for all sorts of issues. There are medical tests or medical doctors can also assist in this regard. But have we got these tests? Have we got these factors we consider when we are dealing with cannabis intoxication? How can we establish intoxication? Is there, are there any fixed guidelines in this regard? So, Pak, I wouldn't say that there are fixed guidelines as things stand up. Um, as the judgment itself notes, our jurisprudence has not developed sufficiently um, to give us, from a legal perspective, the factors that one needs to consider. But uh, from a medical science perspective, and again, um, here the uh, different uh, publications that and there are particular nuances. Uh, it seems that as a start point, there are certain symptoms that one could observe um, to determine whether someone is intoxicated. 
Now, I, I say this with particular caution because these symptoms are not necessarily present in every particular user of cannabis, but some of these symptoms, at least from medical literature, appear to be euphoria, anxiety, uncontrollable laughter, and increased appetite inattentiveness. Uh, and the like. So uh, those are some of the symptoms, I guess, that an employer can look at. And what the judgment does say is that you can consider the outcome of a THC test um, in considering whether or not someone is high, but what it definitely cannot be is the single component uh, or the single piece of evidence that you look at. So it would seem to me that you would look at the whatever the symptoms are, and our occupational health practitioners, again, would help us with this. Uh, and you'll also then look what the test uh, results yield. And you'll also then look at also whether, in general, the person is impaired from uh, conducting or performing their duties. And you look at all of these factors in then reaching a conclusion as to whether one has been or is intoxicated. I think um, if I can just add to this, I think one of the difficulties for employers that make um, cannabis use quite different to alcohol use is that um, I think the symptoms are different for, for users, as Balandila has pointed out, but also I think the fact that, you know, where, where someone uses cannabis frequently, like Bernadette did, I do think it's often the case that it's much harder to pick up on the symptoms, because often people that frequently use cannabis um, are quite functional and the, the symptoms are much harder to notice for an employer um, where, where you're dealing with frequent users of cannabis. So that's right. a challenge, I think. Yeah, I think you're right in that regard, Audrey. Um, that's intoxication. But let's go one step down if we can. Employers usually have a variety of rules dealing with alcohol use in the workplace. Uh, the most obvious and the most serious offense is typically being under the influence of alcohol. Uh, but there often will be a secondary rule which says uh, if you report for work with a certain level of alcohol in your blood, that is a disciplinary offense as well. Now, that is a much easier offense to prove because it's, you don't have to worry about what intoxication means. It's a much more objective test. And both employees and employers seem to like that test. And the question is, can the same be applied to cannabis? Can we determine a level which says, above this level, you're guilty of a disciplinary offense, even though you may not be intoxicated? I think that's going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with in the future. And, and perhaps you've got some comments on that, Valentini? Uh Certainly, Pak. I mean, it, and, and, and I think this is part of what comes out uh, in the judgment. Um, I mean, it comes out that at present, there isn't a... It does not appear to be a universally accepted level to say, if you have this much THC present in your body, then you are more likely than not to be intoxicated. And this is when uh, an employer or any other person, I guess, who has a particular concern can start to be concerned about your abilities or your impairment. Um, to answer your question, Park, the short answer is that if an employer can establish uh, that such a rule is reasonable, I think they certainly can implement such a rule. Um, so can an employer can establish that, um, that that is an inherent requirement of a job. I think that employers certainly can establish that rule. But what becomes clear, uh, at least to me, is that medical science is going to be very important because in order for an employer to justify any particular level of THC, uh, which they're going to prohibit employees not exceeding, for me, they've got to have to be able to establish that the presence of that THC uh, is indicative of a particular risk, be it from a health and safety perspective or any other factors that can be co uh, considered. And, and, and for that, for us to be able to determine that, uh, I think we certainly need the guidance of uh, our medical science colleagues. What is, of course, I think, Interesting is that in the cannabis uh, for personal use bill, which has now been uh, passed by both houses of parliament and is sitting before the president for signature, is that there has been a particular limit that has been set in that bill uh, for the presence of THC 
uh, in one's body for the purposes of travel. Uh, very quickly, um, that Bill seeks to, amongst other things, amend uh, the National Road Traffic Act and by introducing certain limitations on the presence of THC. In, and it has different guidelines depending on whether you are a professional driver or then a non-professional driver. Uh, in relation to non-professional drivers, um, that is, uh, you cannot have more than five 100 nanograms of um, THC per every thousand milliliters. But in relation to professional drivers, I think this might become quite helpful um, to employers, uh, especially those employers who have professional drivers in their employ. Uh, that limitation is half. And that limitation then also, if you then have uh, THC in your body and you have another detectable narcotic drug. There's also, it's, it's a, it goes down to 125 nanograms for every milliliter um, um, that, that is permissible in your body after which it becomes an offense. So it seems to me that uh, if that bill comes uh, into effect and it passes master, at least in relation to those categories of employees, i.e. those who are professional drivers, so those who are driving um, public transport, uh, and the like, and who are employed to do so, there seems to be that they may, in good time, be a st standard um, limit that would be acceptable uh, for lawyer uh, for employers to rely on. It also may well be that for employees who are who have access to company vehicles, um, then uh, those employers may then also rely on that limitation which will be in the National Road Traffic Act as a rule that they then also then benchmark themselves. Uh, again, we'll have to wait for the bill to come into uh, law and to see, uh, also see that there are no challenges in relation to those particular limitations that arise as a result of it. I suppose the, this means that the legislature assumes that there are accurate and reliable tests available to do to 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 determine these levels or to determine whether these levels have been exceeded. So, it, yes, Parker, that's, that's, you, sorry, Park, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You're absolutely right. I mean, in the context of the, the proposed amendments to the National Road Traffic Act, um, the test, it's a very specific test. They will only be testing it in relation to blood at the moment. Maybe over time they might change it, uh, but they will only be testing it in relation to blood. And even where they are testing for alcohol, and drugs, they will test the alcohol in with via breathalyzer test, but in relation to the THC, they will test that uh, in relation to the blood test. Sure. Um, thanks, Valendili. The other question that always comes up in this topic when we're dealing with it, whether it's alcohol or whether it is uh, cannabis or other drugs, is this issue of zero tolerance. We've seen it in a number of decisions of the court. Audrey, can you tell us what zero tolerance means and what did the court decide in this regard or indicate in this regard? What is zero tolerance? Yes, so, I mean, I think that is the, the first and important point to make is that people speak very broadly about a zero tolerance policy when it can actually mean a number of different things. I mean, you could, for example, have a zero tolerance policy which says, or when you refer to a zero tolerance policy, you could mean a policy that says that if you contravene a rule, whatever that rule might be, um, it will not be tolerated and disciplinary action will be taken. Or you could have a zero tolerance policy that says um, we have a rule that prohibits the presence of alcohol or drugs in an employee's um, system. And because we because there's zero tolerance, you're not allowed onto the premises. Um, or you could have a rule that says the contravention of a particular rule, whatever that rule might be, um, will not be tolerated and will result in dismissal. Um, so that, that's a zero tolerance policy that actually prescribes a sanction for breaching the rule and there won't be a deviation from that particular sanction. So in the Labour Appeal Court judgment, they do actually deal um, quite a bit with what our law has been to date in relation to zero tolerance policies when it comes to intoxication from alcohol. And the court um, confirms that there's been an, and cites a number of judgments in which our court has held that it's not acceptable to say that dismissal will always follow intoxication. 
And uh, there's quite a nice quote from the uh, a judgment involving shop rights of the Labour Appeal Court, um, in which the court said the law does not allow an employer to adopt a zero tolerance approach for all infractions, regardless of its appropriateness or proportionality to the offence, and then expect a CCMA commissioner to fall in line with such an approach. The touchstone of the law of dismissal is fairness, and an employer cannot contract out of it or fashion as it would a no-go area for commissioners. A zero tolerance policy would be appropriate where, for example, the stock is gold. This was in the context of dealing with a zero tolerance policy relation to stock theft um, or, or uh, misappropriation of stock, uh, where the stock is gold, but it would not necessarily be appropriate where an employee of the same employer removes a crust of bread otherwise designed for the refuse bin. So basically the court confirmed in the Labour Appeal Court that you can't just have a zero tolerance policy which prescribes dismissal um, for a particular offence um, without it being justifiable and appropriate um, and rationally connected to your, your operational needs. Thanks, Audrey. I see there's already a question dealing with this topic, and I think it's, to me it's one of the most important topics that we have to deal with is most companies or a lot of companies will introduce a zero tolerance rule uh, in another form. And they will say that if any person tests positive or not negative and is over a certain limit, that's a disciplinary offense. But the court seems to be saying that such a broad approach, such a broad prohibition is not acceptable. Certain people would fall within the ambit of such a rule or could fall within the ambit of such a rule, but others not. In other words, can you or must you distinguish between various categories of workers when you formulate these rules? To me, that's an important question. And thanks to the person who already asked that question in the audience. Thanks. Um, yes, that was one of the key the key reasons why the Labour Appeal Court took issue with Barlowald's policy. Um, so Barlowald's stance was that we have over 3,000 employees working in various countries, and our environment is generally considered to be dangerous in that there's only about 10% of our employees that don't work in high-risk areas. And so it's impractical to have a policy that differentiates between employees, and we have to apply this, this policy uniformly across the business, this zero tolerance um, policy in relation to possession and use of drugs and alcohol. Um, and the Labour Appeal Court unfortunately didn't accept this. And they said that um, that is what resulted in the policy being overbroad and that it was unfair to apply a zero tolerance policy uniformly across the whole workforce without having any regard to employees' positions and considering a, and, and analyzing or having regard to the actual risk that a particular employee may pose in their particular circumstances. So if we take Bernadette, for example, she, as I said before, was an office-based worker. She didn't operate um, machinery. She didn't work in a dangerous area of the business. And that was one of the reasons why the court found that um, the policy was overboard to apply it to her because she didn't necessarily pose any particular risk if she tested not negative for cannabis. Um, and so what this results in is, is that it is more work for employers. Unfortunately, we're not going to necessarily just be able to have uniform zero tolerance policies that we apply across the business. And employers will have to undertake a risk analysis, um, as is required in any event in terms of Occupational Health and Safety Act, to identify which positions and which categories of employees it would be appropriate to apply this sort of zero tolerance policy to. Thank you, Audrey. Um, I agree with you. To me, this is one of the most important aspects of the decision, the one that's going to give employers the most difficulty to deal with. Um, another issue that interests me is the emphasis on privacy. The court seems to have argued and or accepted that it is unfair discrimination because of an unjustified infringement on privacy. The question I would think we may have to deal with in the future is, Will this emphasis on privacy perhaps persuade or employers or sorry, maybe CCMA commissioners of the court to look at other disciplinary rules and say, no, this rule, which typically you've been entitled to apply, 
cannot apply no longer. It's an unreasonable rule because it infringes privacy. In other words, can we see the privacy requirement impacting on other disciplinary rules? Is that a possibility, do you think? And if so, where? Balandini? Yeah. So, uh, in my mind, uh, Park, privacy has always been an important consideration. And we've seen this uh, in, in, in our law in the context of uh, off duty misconduct, where an employee is ostensibly doing something in their personal space, their private uh, space after, after hours. And on, in relation to certain occasions, an employer has been entitled to take issue with particular conduct. Um, and the test that has typically been used, which I suspect is going to be remain the same test, is to first assess, does an employer have a legitimate interest uh, in relation to the conduct of the employee whilst in their private space? And if, it does, if the employer does have the legitimate interest, uh, insofar as the employer is intruding into the employee's realm of privacy, uh, is such an intrusion relevant? And we've seen this, for example, when an employee does something uh, which is on the face of it, none of the business of the employer in the sense that it, it has nothing to do with the employer, but that employee's conduct can be linked to the employer or the employee rather can be linked to the employer. And then the question then starts about the reputation of the employer. And typically that will present as bringing the employer's name into disrepute. So it seems to me that um, there may be uh, as always, when there is a, 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 an interesting judgment that happens, that there might be an, a heightened awareness of this consideration, but I don't understand the laws to have changed. I certainly don't understand this judgment to suggest that the right to privacy is absolute and there cannot be an intersection between the right to privacy and uh, an employer's uh, legitimate interest and at the very least the protection of an employer's legit legitimate interests. Just if I can maybe just add something to what Balandile has said. Um, I mean, I agree completely that the law still remains the same in that an employer has got to show that what the employee is doing outside of the workplace has an impact or a, an effect on them and, and on the employment relationship. And there's quite a nice paragraph in the judgment that makes this very clear where the court said, um, within this context of the right to privacy, I can think of no more an irrelevant fact to the employer in this case than the appellant enjoying a joint during her evenings in the privacy of her home. The use of a blood test alone, it's a bit confusing because in some sections of the judgment, they talk about a urine test and in other sections, they talk about a blood test. But anyway, he goes on to say the use of a blood test alone without proof of impairment on the work premises is a violation of the appellant's dignity and privacy. This as the policy prevents her from engaging in conduct that is of no effect to her employer, yet her employer is able to force her to choose between her job and the exercise of her right to consume cannabis. So I think that paragraph quite nicely outlines that the legal test remains that it has to have some sort of effect and be of relevance to the employer before the employer can take issue with what the employee is doing outside of work. <sighs> So in Audrey, I, I found that quote quite uh, interesting because um, it seems to me that in the assessment of the of Benedetti's uh, of the impact of Benedetti's uh, smoking uh, cannabis was limited to health and safety, and also then it's it say uh, the judge went, was at pains to say she was not impaired from performing her functions. Um, and then I was looking at some of the literature that talks about the prolonged effects of cannabis use. So it, in my mind, it seemed as if the LAC in this occasion looked at um, the effects of her use of cannabis. Uh, when she goes to work, will she be intoxicated? And that appears to have been the limitation of the effects of cannabis in relation to Benedict. Um, but some of the literature in relation to the prolonged use, which Benedict is a confessed, um, let's call it a chronic user, um, is that over time, this may result in uh, a depressed mood, which is characterized by apathy, lack of motivation, loss of interest. And when I look at these things, in my mind, it seems to be things that uh, would feed into 
performance in a workplace? And I think the question that I think will have to be answered, and again, our medical scientists are going to have to help us in this regard, is whether there are other effects which don't immediately present, but we, they, which have a risk of presenting over time to the use of cannabis and whether then testing for THC uh, may be an indicator that there's a risk that presents to the employer. And then employers are going to have to deal with how uh, to address those. It may not be an issue of misconduct, but it may present itself as an issue of incapacity or an issue of poor performance. And we're just going to have to wait and see where the science leads us to. Yes, yeah, I think that's a very important point to note. This is very much limited to intoxication and risk of intoxication. But I think you're you're right, Balandile. It, it in due course will be interesting to see whether other risks emanate from chronic use of cannabis that an employer can say, well, this does actually affect us. I suppose the the and there's a rough analogy between in, when you're dealing with alcohol of the person being an alcoholic, you immediately go from a disciplinary approach to a uh, incapacity approach. And I think it's a rough equivalent there. Are you agreeing with, with that? Yeah. Um, the idea, it, we, we've been discussing it in the context of disciplining people uh, when you can fire somebody. But the context also, if you look at the judgment, the court also found that the the conduct of the employer was not only automatically unfair in terms of a dismissal dispute, but also discriminatory in terms of the Employment Equity Act. Uh, it seems to us that there may be some sort of issues or areas where it may not be a dismissal, the actions of the employer, but it may still constitute unfair, uh, unfair discrimination on some ground or another. Any comments on that? Um, maybe let me take a, the first stab at this one, Park. Uh, I think certainly, yes. Um, I mean, if we look at, in the case of Benedict, um, the, the employer's policy here is that once you test not negative for um, THC, you are then sent home uh, and you are given a period of time within which to clear the presence of THC from your body, and then you are retested. But during that period of time, uh, you are on unpaid, you are either are on annual leave, if your annual leave is depleted, you are on unpaid leave. And I've seen this type of policy also in relation to other employers. Uh, and the, if then a person is then unpaid, it would seem to me that uh, an employee may be tempted not to wait until they become dismissed, but then challenge uh, the employer's uh, decision not to pay them during that time where they have been uh, sent home to clear the presence of THC. So that's one of the ways it seems to me that those could present not resulting in a dismissal. Yes, I think what you're saying is that arguably an employee could pursue an unfair discrimination claim on the basis of the fact that they've been sent home and they aren't being paid and that by doing that, the employer is discriminating against them because they are a regular cannabis user. And one of the other interesting topics that Balandile and I were debating earlier this morning, to which we have no answers, but is the question of um, in the recruitment process, if you become aware that someone that you're recruiting is a regular cannabis user and you decide not to employ them on that basis, what sort of risk does that pose in terms of a potential unfair discrimination claim in light of this judgment? Yeah, I agree. Right. Uh any other comments that we wish to make? You, you either you Balandila, or you want to make before we get on to the key takeaways? Anything else that you want to so comment it, on? It's, it seems to me, Park, that um, what the judgment seems to leave space for is that um, employers can take action for more than just uh, intoxication. And it seems to me that... Um, employers can consider a rule that may be different or have a different uh, impact uh, for employees who do not present like Benedict circumstances. If employees work in a generally hazardous environment, 
And it seems there that the court, to me at least, has left an opening uh, that in those circumstances, the an employer may be able to have a rule which prohibits a certain degree or a certain amount of THC in a person's body. So uh, I don't think that this judgment is all doom and gloom. I still think that there's a lot that employers can play with, and it's just going really to be a question of conducting an appropriate risk assessment and having the scientific evidence to back yourself up. No, thanks. Um, before we go over to question time, are the, do you want to sort of indicate any sort of key takeaways or most important points that we should be emphasizing for the purpose of this judgment? Audrey, uh, Balandini, any thoughts? So I'd say for me, the first key takeaway from the judgment is that, or the key learning from the judgment is that the presence of THC in an employee's system detected through a test does not necessarily equal intoxication. Um, and if your disciplinary rule is that an employee um, can't be intoxicated at work, then you have to prove intoxication before you can take action. Um, and then the second key takeaway, sorry, Balandile, before, before you give yours that I just wanted to, to mention is that these things are going to be very um, fact specific and it is going to all depend on the circumstances of a particular employee. Um, and, and Bernadette had very particular circumstances that applied to her. The, uh, the effect of the judgment isn't that an employer can't dismiss anyone if they are, uh, or if they do not test negative for THC in their system. I, I certainly agree with you. And I think I've just um, highlighted one of the other takeaways, uh, which is that uh, for me, employers must absolutely conduct their risk assessments. And I mean, what comes out of the judgment is the importance of a health and safety risk assessment. But they, the risk assessment may go beyond that. It may go into performance issues and the like. So I think that um, it would... It, it would be good due diligence for uh, our clients to conduct a risk assessment and then make sure that we are constantly consulting uh, with our occupational health practitioners. I cannot overstress that enough with our scientists. So to make sure that uh, the rules that we ultimately have are rooted or are backed up by empirical evidence that we so that if, if we are challenged, we can then present that to the court. In my mind, that's going to be one of the most important uh, consideration or the most important factors in ensuring that an employer successfully de uh, defends the reasonableness or otherwise of the rule. Um, and then I think also um, it will be quite helpful. Um, I think we must keep an eye on the cannabis bill uh, because I think that that might be uh, easy pickings and employers can certainly lean on uh, the limitations that arise out of there, especially in categories of employees who are drivers or who drive as part of their general duties. And also, I think we may be able to lean on it in relation to uh, employees who use forklifts, who operate general heavy uh, machinery. I, I think that uh, that might be a good starting point. And then ultimately, I think also let's just keep an eye on the developments in relation to the breathalyzer test, because if we can have an apparatus that allows us to dictate recent use. Uh, I think it will heighten the justification or the evidence of, um, of a reasonable rule because then uh, if you have smoked um, in the last three hours, I think that you'll be closer than, than not to intoxication and it might make things a lot more easier. Yeah, I think we're into a... Um steep learning curve here we're going to have to think very carefully about these issues and we'll have to learn as we go along and maybe the courts will have to give us further guidance in this regard um well let's start with some of the questions that have come up one of the ones that's intrigued us and which has come up here and also illustrates issues that we perhaps haven't thought of yet is the one question of when you have a urine function you allow people to have out drink alcohol but what if an employee comes along and starts smoking, as Audrey would say, is all? What is the position? Is it disciplinary? Can you can you prevent that? 
you know, to me it's an interesting question because it's things we haven't thought or thought about yet and how that there can be context that we will have to still to consider. In, in, I think, in, Kaka, I think that might be a, 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 at least an easier one to deal with in the sense that um, consumption of alcohol at a year end function is not um, illegal or is, uh, is not a criminal offense. Uh, in the context of cannabis, what has been decriminalized is the consumption of cannabis in a private place. Uh, and I think certainly in that context, the employer's space uh, where it is hosting the year end function cannot be argued to be a private place. So for me, that one is a clearer misconduct. And in fact, I think that 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 example is dealt with in the judgment, and that's exactly is the reasoning that the judge uh, applies. Yeah, I, I think that must be the correct approach. Um, I don't know how you draft your memorandums and tell employees that when you're holding your your, your Christmas party, but that's another matter. Um, two or three people have asked, referred to the general safety regulations through a, a intoxication of the Occupation Health and Safety Act. Uh, what is its relevance here? Can you uh, give us some idea of what, why, why is this relevant and how is it relevant? So I think that probably goes to, I mean, I'm, I'm not an occupational health and safety expert, but I think what it probably goes to is what we were saying about um, conducting a risk assessment. And I think there are, Balandila is probably a better place to answer this, but I think there are requirements in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, and in terms of some of the regulations um, that you aren't allowed to permit access to the workplace if there is intoxication. Um, and it's, it's that, the, you know, I think, again, the important thing to bear in mind about the Bernadette judgment is that what the court took issue with was her dismissal, not necessarily her exclusion from the workplace. And potentially, if you're complying with occupational health and safety regulations and laws um, and not permitting uh, employees to enter the workplace because they are intoxicated or they, they have not tested negative um, in keeping with those laws, that wouldn't be a problem. It's a question, you know, there's a distinction between not permitting access to the workplace and disciplinary action uh, uh, and dismissal. I don't know if you want to add to that, Bandile. Audrey, I completely agree with you. And in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and I think it's gen uh, one of the general regulations, uh, an employer is prohibited from allowing any person access on to the workplace if they are intoxicated from drugs or alcohol. Uh, there's also a similar regulation under the Mine Health and Safety Act, which similarly prohibit um, to an employer from permitting a person who's intoxicated and who may present and or may present a danger and be and, uh, to someone else's health and safety into the workplace. So I, I would I imagine that's the relevance part. Of course, the interesting issue that arises, and, and just going back to our conversation about unfair possible unfair discrimination claims, is what to do about paying an employee during that period where they're not allowed to access the workplace. No, absolutely. And, that's a, and I think that is an interesting one, uh, because it seems to me, at least, I, I'm quite keen on hearing your views, uh, is that if, a, in, if the legislation pro prohibits an employer from allowing you onto the workplace if you are intoxicated or present particular risk and you then present with those particular uh risks uh, in a state of intoxication in my mind you have incapacitated yourself from mm. rendering services or tendering services and i in my view you are an employer is certainly permitted uh not to pay you because of the from just the general principles of contract Yes, yeah, I, I think, guess it's similar to the, the concept that we had during COVID lockdowns um, and the impossibility of performance, supervening impossibility of performance of the employment contract because it was unlawful for an employee to come to work. Um, and I guess it's a similar, a similar situation. If the employee can't work due to legislation, um, particularly as a result of their own conduct, then you're probably justified in not paying them. Yeah, um, I think in, in contract terms, we would argue and say that they aren't tendering proper performance. They aren't tendering yeah. lawful performance. And, and therefore, you don't have to pay in that regard, I suppose. So an interesting issue that we sort of debated ourselves and which I considered is when we look at all the, what we've been dealing with and when can we justify testing or dismissal, we've looked at it primarily from a health and safety perspective. 
Uh, are there any other considerations that we could take into account in determining whether a rule is justified? And one question that came up in this regard is the following. It's, it posits a situation where you've got a driver or drivers who take cannabis regularly. Can the employer introduce some sort of rule restricting the use of cannabis or because of the potential vicarious liability of that employer for accidents that may arise uh, if that driver drives or the drivers cause an accident? Is, I suppose it boils down to is, is vicarious liability or potential vicarious liability something that justifies a rule of some nature in this regard? Any comments on that? Um, so, Pat, I think I that... I thought you were surprised, but I think it's an interesting question. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Pat, I, I certainly think that um, if one can justify it, and for me, that's what it's going to come down to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One can identify a risk, uh, and it not need not always be presenting in health and safety. One can um, identify an operational risk, and operational yeah. risks vary. Uh, from the reputation of an organization uh, straight to the quality of their performance, uh, whether innovation is important, whatever the case might be. So one has, identifies that issue that is operationally important. And then one then identifies the risk that the use of cannabis presents to that issue. And, the, and for that, then you need the medical science to be with you. And that's going to be part of the what is going to be in my mind most important as this particular jurisprudence develops. If you can then have those two issues and then have the necessary evidence to say that in relation to this particular role, uh, if this person consumes cannabis, even if they're not regularly coming into my workplace intoxicated, but these are the particular risks that present either immediately or over time, and here's the evidence to back it up, I think you can look into those areas. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, one question that, sorry, Audrey, you want to say anything? No, no, I just said that I agree. I agree with what Valentina okay. said. Uh, a very technical question, and I'm not certain that uh, there is an easy answer to this. How long does it take for a blood test to be done and for the results to be available? Uh, have we any ideas about this? I mean, I presume the blood test has to be sent to some sort of laboratory and it'll depend on the, 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 uh, the laboratory's capacity to deal with the matter. But I suppose the actual test, how long does it take? I, I don't have any answer to that. If anybody's had any experience, let us know. Uh, Balia, do you know any of these? Have you dealt with this? Uh, uh, no, I know. I mean, from the context of um, alcohol testing, I mean, I know that a sample is drawn as soon as it's drawn. And some employers have the capacity to do that on site. Some employers have to send uh, employees off site. So that one is just a, a question, I guess, of practicalities as to how long it takes the laboratories to process it, that's not within my expertise. Another interesting question. Um, let's assume the employer is now going to introduce some new rules dealing with uh, use and abuse of cannabis in the workplace. And it enters into a consultation process and some sort of agreement is reached with the employees and or union that there will be no discrimination between or, or differentiation between categories of workers. It will be an absolute rule. Uh, will that justify such an approach? Can the employees or, by collective, or individually or collectively agree to this type of situation? Any, any problems with that? I personally can't see any problem when it's a collective agreement. Uh, you know, collective agreement can deal with the stuff. I don't think a collective agreement would be regarded as being... Uh, unlawful or contrary to public policy if it contains such a disciplinary rule? I'm not sure if um, I know the answer to that either. I think if, if there's an agreement, there's an agreement. But interestingly, in the judgments at one point when dealing with the way that Barlow World applied this policy uniformly across all employees, the judge did make a comment about this isn't a matter of collective uh, uh, labor law. I'm just trying to find the actual quote. Uh, which almost seems to suggest that if it was a matter of collective um, a, a, a collective agreement, then there wouldn't be as much of a problem with applying it uniformly. Um, 
So Audrey, whilst you find that passage, uh, um, I think that if you had a collective agreement uh, reaching that um, for the, if this was a regular misconduct and what you're trying to consider is the valid, validity or reasonableness of the rule, I, I, I think you'd be almost certainly home and dry as an employer if you relied on the collective agreement. But from a perspective of unfair discrimination, I don't think that um, it is a complete answer that there is a collective agreement. Uh, something can be agreed to between parties, but it can constitute unfair discrimination. And I think that that is still open to interrogation by the courts. Yeah, I agree. Um, a question that talks about zero tolerance in a different concept. I'm not certain that it's strictly linked to, to cannabis, but it's an interesting one. Does no tolerance or fur or imply zero tolerance in respect of wording in your fraud policy? For example, can you say in your fraud policy, zero tolerance? Uh, I would suspect that zero tolerance is accepted in that type of situation. You don't have to worry about it. And, and here you're dealing, I suppose, not you're dealing with zero tolerance with regard to the sentence rather, or the, the disciplinary measure that you're going to take rather than anything else. Uh, any questions or any issues on that regard? Or, or comments? Now, I think we'd probably be hard pressed to find a situation where fraud doesn't justify dismissal. Yeah. Um, that would probably be highly unusual to find a situation where someone commits fraud, but it does, but dismissal isn't justified. So yeah. you probably could have a policy that says if you commit fraud, it won't be tolerated and you will be dismissed. Yeah. A final question that we, we, we've got another two minutes and I'd like to deal with because it's come up two or three times. Uh, the question is, is the matter being taken on an appeal? And if so, what issues or what 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 are the prospects of success? What issues will uh, exercise the mind of the constitutional court? Um, as far, we don't know at present whether there is an appeal or a petition for I think the time limits for asking for leave to appeal has not have not prescribed yet, so that we can find that later later on. But, you know, I think it's, there's a distinct chance that, you know, that this issue will come before the Constitutional Court on appeal or maybe in another decision dealing with it, because it's a very important issue and the Constitutional Court will have to decide. It does deal with the important human right of dignity and privacy, that type of one. So it's, it's an ideal type of decision for the Constitutional Court to take into account and to deal with. Um, yeah, Pak, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's another judgment and by the Labour Court, it's the Marisi judgment, which is currently before the LAC. So uh, we're certainly going to be seeing some um, jurisprudence develop where these issues are concerned one way or the other. You, which judgment did you refer to? By the it, it's uh, Marisi, I think it's Petro SA. Oh, yes. uh, this is Marisi, yeah. Okay. I, what what issues will be to consider by the court? Um, uh, you know, I think it'll it'll be a full blown test of everything the labor the constant the LAC decided. I, I think it you know it, it, there are some contentious issues from a legal perspective there, but um, we'll have to see. I, I think it is imminently appealable in the sense that it's an issue that must be considered by the constitutional court. And well, we'll have to see what grounds they'll appeal on. I don't think we can really make any prediction in this regard. We certainly can't make any prediction as to whether it'll be successful at this stage. You know, the constitutional court consists of 11 judges. It's going to be a very contentious issue that they can discuss, and maybe it'll even be a split decision in the Constitutional Court. Um, there was a question, sorry, it came up before, but somebody asked us about the Morasi decision. What, what, what is, why is it, is it relevant to this discussion at all? Uh, did, if I, what did it deal with? Did it deal with uh, intoxication or did it deal with, it deal, can you just give us some idea what Morasi decision dealt with? Um, I, I think it, it also is a, an unfair discrimination judgment. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. there, I think what is um, different is that the employer there, I believe, was a rock drill operator um, at a chemical plant, and he tested positive for cannabis um, and that he had smoked outside the workplace. So there may be one or two nuances from a factual perspective, but that's in broad strokes what the Marasi okay. judgment is. About. Okay. Right, I see the time is 1.31. We're under strict instructions to, uh, that our clients only like to, are only available for one hour for these type of things. And otherwise, tolerance to our, what we're talking about disappears. So after one hour, I will conclude the session by saying thank you very much. And 
I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. Thanks a lot. Anybody else want to say bye-bye? Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.